Welcome to our lecture online, and here we're going to continue looking at our sun and to understand nuclear fusion at the core of the sun a little bit better. So this is a picture, kind of a diagram of the sun. Here's the core of the sun, and this is where all the action takes place as far as the energy production of the sun. This is where protons are slammed together at very high velocities and fused together to form helium. Now, I want to give you an understanding of how much how big the repulsive forces are of two protons trying to slam together. Remember, the nuclear strong force that actually overtakes and, and overcomes the repulsion between the protons, that nuclear strong force is enormously strong, but it's only effective over very, very, very short distances. So if the protons don't get close enough, the repulsive force will simply push them apart. So how strong are those repulsive forces? Well, I want to give you an idea of how to look at that. And so we're going to take a look at what we call electrostatic repulsion. So let's assume we have one gram of hydrogen. So now, no, hydrogen is a gas, but let's say we have one gram of the gas, one gram of hydrogen. Now we know that in one gram of hydrogen, you have Avogadro's number of protons and electrons because a single hydrogen atom is a single proton with a single electron zipping around it. And let's, let's say we have Avogadro's number of those uh, hydrogen atoms together that will have a mass of one gram. So one gram of hydrogen is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23 protons plus 6.02 times 10 to the 23 electrons. All right, so how much is that? Well, let me give you a feel for it. If you have, for example, one gram of water, it would take up about this much volume. One gram of gas, well, depends how dense you make it. Again, it would only be about one gram, just a very small amount of gas. And if you were to then to separate the protons and the electrons, what would happen? Imagine, for example, you have a little box. Like, let's say this represents a little box, had a lid. You could open up the lid. You could take a hydrogen atom, and you could separate the protons from the electrons. So you need two boxes, one for the protons, one for the electrons. So you open up the lid, you put in a proton, close the lid real fast, then you take the electron, open up the lid, put the electron in, close it real fast. So now you have one proton, one electron in there. And let's say you keep doing that for a while, you take one gram of hydrogen, you separate the protons from the electrons, put the proton in the one box, put the electrons in the other box. You keep doing that, of course, it would take you a very long time to do one gram of hydrogen, because that's a whole lot of protons and electrons, but let's assume you could do it. All right, now you would have one box of protons and one box of electrons. Now let's say we we'll put these about one meter apart, a little bit more than three feet apart. And of course, since all of these are positively charged and all of these are negatively charged, they would attract each other because opposite charges attract. Never mind that the ones that are in the box will repel each other, so we'll ignore that for a moment because technically speaking, it was very hard to put one gram of protons in a little box. All right, so now let's assume we have, oh, here we go, one box and it's filled with this many protons, Avogadro's number of protons, amounting to one gram, which is one one thousand of a kilogram, in this box right here, and one meter away, we would have a box filled with nothing but electrons. How many electrons? Again, Avogadro's number. So what would be the attractive forces between them? How much force would there be pulling those together? It would be quite large, so let's find out what it is. It turns out that the force of attraction between any two charged objects is equal to K, times the product of the two charges, Q1 and Q2, divided by the distance between them squared. All right, K is a constant that's about 9 times 10 to the 9th. That would be newtons meters squared per coulomb squared. A coulomb is a unit of charge. Multiply times the charges contained within each of these boxes. It turns out that if you were to separate one gram of hydrogen into the protons and electrons, you would have about 100,000 coulombs of protons and 100,000 coulombs of negative charges. So it would be 100,000 coulombs for the positive charges and about 100,000 coulombs for the negative charges, for the, uh, for the electrons. Oh, I forgot my C there. All right, for coulombs. Now you divide that by the distance between them squared, so it would be about one meter, one meter squared. And if you were to look at that, that would be five zeros, ten zeros, another nine zeros, that would be nineteen zeros, so that would be equal to nine times ten to the nineteenth newton, newtons, almost one times ten to the twentieth newtons. Wow, how many pounds is that? Well, that's roughly, oh, let's see, that's roughly about two times ten to the nineteenth pounds of force. 
Wow, how big is 10 to 19 pounds? Wow, that would be an enormous amount. Uh, whew, two times 10 to the 12 is billion, two times 10, so it would be more, that would be about, hmm, I was about 20 million trillion pounds. Okay, can you see that number there? 20 million trillion pounds of force trying to pull those two boxes together. Imagine one gram of hydrogen separated into protons and electrons put in two little boxes this far apart you would have a force of millions of trillions of pounds trying to pull these together. So electro for electrostatic forces are just absolutely enormous. That's why electricity is so dangerous. It doesn't take a lot of charge to make electricity really, really dangerous. So I then said, well, what if we were to separate those two boxes, maybe put one on one end of the earth and the other one on the other end of the earth. Of course, there's no such thing as the end of the earth, so to speak, but imagine if this was the earth and you put one box at the equator on one side and one box at the equator on the other side so that the distance between them would be more than 12,000 kilometers, almost 13,000 kilometers away. So let's round it off to about 13,000 kilometers from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. So let's say we took those very same two boxes now and separate them by that distance. So instead of one meter uh, apart, let's now call it 13 million meters apart because of a kilometer is a thousand meters, so 13 million meters, and we have to square it, of course, because it's divided by the radius squared, or the distance squared. So now let's work that out. So we have 100,000, uh, we square that, because there's two of them, times 9e to the ninth, and then we divide that by, oh, did I do that wrong? 1, 2, 3, 5, 10, well, it's 19. Let me do this one more time. 100. 1, 2, 3, square that, ah, that's better, times 9e to the 9th equals, now divide that by 13 million squared equals, and it would still be about 500,000 newtons. So the force, if I were to put those in two little boxes, one gram of hydrogen pulled apart so that we have one gram of protons and the equivalent number of electrons in number, I forgot the number of electrons, and now we put the two boxes at the opposite end of the Earth, 13,000 kilometers apart, 8,000 miles apart. The force between them now would be somewhere in the, in the range of 500,000 newtons or about 100,000 pounds of force. Imagine two little boxes with that little hydrogen in it, one gram worth of hydrogen in the two little boxes, the force between them when they're 8,000 miles apart, it would still be 100,000 pounds of force or 500,000 newtons trying to pull them together. Just an absolute amount of force. So you can imagine now when you go to the very center of the sun, the core of the sun, under enormous pressure, very, very dense, where you're trying to push these protons together, they must have enormous amount of speed in order to overcome those repulsive forces. The protons will simply not come close enough for the nuclear strong force to pull them together. And that's why the minimum temperature in the core that you would need or that the protons need to be moving fast enough so that they will overcome the nuclear the uh, repulsive forces so that nuclear fusion actually could take place. And that's why we know that the minimum temperature necessary is 10 million degrees Kelvin. And of course, in some ways, that's kind of good because otherwise stars that were kind of tiny in size would also become stars. Even planets like Jupiter could become stars if nuclear fusion could occur at much lower temperatures. If the repulsive forces of those protons and electrons weren't as great, then you would have nuclear fusion at much lower temperatures and you would have a very different universe. So there may be a reason for all these things. But anyway, that hopefully gives you a pretty good picture of how nuclear fusion takes place by overcoming these enormous repulsive forces, which they are indeed enormous, and temperatures required for that is more than 10 million degrees to get nuclear fusion going. That's electrostatic repulsion.